Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures, the innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation? What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby confronts William Quantrell, the controversial Confederate guerrilla made infamous by the sacking, raiding, and massacre in pro-Union Lawrence, Kansas. Welcome to another performance of Bankers and Bushwhackers. In 1857, Captain Quantrill, the border between Missouri and Kansas had been erupting in violence for two years over whether Kansas would be a free state or a slave state when you and two friends or partners boarded a steamboat in Ohio headed for the state of Kansas. Were you attracted to the fighting? No, cheap land in Kansas. But there's also a story that uh, you were coming from Mendota, Illinois, where you'd killed a man. You never have to run from a dead man. <laughs> but it is true, I did kill a man in Mendota. And didn't they put you in jail for that? No, no, they decided it was self-defense. Your family was from Dover, Ohio, and you were a school teacher. You came west to the state of Kansas to farm initially. Oh, uh, yes. And you, you picked Marie Mar Mar de, de Seine. Interesting that you picked the place where John Brown had murdered five people and where some of the worst violence in Kansas was going on. Well, I was only 19 years old at the time. I didn't know anything about what was going on in Kansas. I was just trying to make my way in the world. But you didn't last long as a farmer. Well, I knew that farming was not my calling. You, you said when you first got to Kansas, you, you were very high on some of the abolitionists, some of the free state people. Jim Lane later became senator, was a leader of the free staters in Lawrence. Uh, you said Jim Lane is as good a man as we have here. So you changed your mind. I realized that in Kansas, most of the butchery, most of the thieving was done by the abolitionists. Now they call it some holy right that they had to do this. Now, I don't know who has the right to hack up people just because they own slaves. It was true at that point that the uh, border ruffians, as they were sometimes known as they liked to be known themselves, led by David Atchison, the senator from Missouri, came over and were voting in large numbers in the state of Kansas and then returning to Missouri. They also, there was a, initially a, a raid of some of those folks on Kansas. They tried to destroy the Eldridge Hotel. Well, it seemed to be a lot of tit for tat in those days. Right. But you fell in with some of these border ruffians in, uh, in Lawrence, actually. Well, the truth is, I was a school teacher, but there's no money in teaching. <laughs> some things don't change, uh, Mr. Quadril. <laughs> so y you fall in with these, with these various groups, and you seem to continue to have relations with people like John Walker and John Dean, who are free staters, and at the same time, you seem to be developing these relationships with the border ruffians. Do you convince a group, including a group of Quakers, if I'm not mistaken, to make a raid into Missouri, supposedly to free slaves? Tell us about the Walker raid, the Morgan Walker farm, which was one of the bigger, wealthier farms in eastern Jackson County, pretty far away from the, from the border. Well, first off, I didn't have to convince any abolitionists that they don't want to make a profit. And I told them that there was money and horses and slaves at the Morgan Walker Ranch. And they were more than willing to go with me. But what they didn't know is that I went there and talked to Andrew Walker, the son, told him we were coming, set up an ambush for these guys. When I actually pulled off the raid and we killed all four men, I got arrested. And I had to come up with a story that would save my hide. And so I told them that I came to Kansas with my older brother from Kentucky, and we were gonna go to California, but we got raided from Jayhawkers. 32 of them killed my brother and left me for dead. There was a Shawnee Indian, Spy Buck Go Lightly, who saved me. Spy Buck Go Lightly, holy cow. And I went after these Jayhawkers, and these abolitionists were part of them. 
I believe I'm correct in saying not a single word that you've just said is in fact true, even though you, <laughs> you did tell this story to the walkers to explain your behavior on this, in this raid. Once a story saves your life, it becomes the truth. So the Civil War breaks out, uh, Mr. Quantrill, Captain Quantrill, and you are, in fact, uh, part of uh, Confederate States of America forces. You go down and you fight the, the first great battle in the, uh, in the western part of the country, the Battle of Wilson's Creek, down near Springfield. That's right, Sterling Price's army. Uh, your biographer, John Edwards, who was the uh, editor of the Kansas City Times in, in the 1870s and 80s, and, uh, he painted uh, this dashing picture of you that you were mounted on a splendid horse, armed with a Sharps carbine and four Navy revolvers, uh, a red shirt uniform, and an oriflamme, a sweeping black plume. You advanced with the farthest, fell back with the last, and were always cool and deadly and the General Price himself, notorious for being superbly indifferent under fire, remarked your bearing and caused mention to be made of you most favorably. The historian writing, uh, quoting this goes on to say that no report mentioning you was ever made in the battle. What's the truth? The truth is, I was a daring fighter, but I did not like the Army Regiment. Wilson's Creek was a slow, bloody battle moving masses of men back and forth, lining men up and shooting them down. Over 300 men on both sides died, over a 1,000 wounded, and that was not my type of fighting. Now, I was daring, but I had had enough of Army life after Sterling Price left. After the Battle of Wilson's Creek, a number of things happened. Uh, General Fremont is in charge of the western part of the, the United States for the Union, and he issues the first martial law order, and also a partial emancipation in Missouri for, for the slaves of anyone uh, endorsing the rebellion. That leads to justification on the part of some of the Jayhawkers, and Jim Lane, and Doc Jennison, and James Montgomery, and some of the others. And, and they begin raids, raids on Butler and Parkville, in which looting seems to be the, the primary object. In fact, Jim Lane said, everything from a Durham cow to a Shanghai chicken must be cleaned out. Well, if Jim Lane is going to try and butcher the western Missouri towns, then we're going to start doing raids into Kansas, give them a little taste of their own medicine. Now, Jim Lane went on to Osceola, Osceola was one of those important ports on the Osage River. Many merchants, many goods there, and he burned it to the ground. Nine people killed, the rest scattered along the hillside. That town never recovered. It's important to note that you remembered some of the things that Jim Lane did personally. He burned down Osceola, and these nine, nine people killed pretty indiscriminately. They weren't armed, they weren't combatants. But there's still there's some rules of war aren't there? I mean, rules about women, rules uh, about unarmed people? I mean, well, we never harmed the ladies. Southern chivalry was in place for us. For much of the time in the early days, we would capture Union troops and parole them when we were done with whatever we were doing. Well, and that word parole is kind of an interesting word because it, the definition of the word parole basically changes from the beginning of the war when you would release these Union soldiers. Later on, when you'd capture Union sympathizers or actual Union troops and you'd tell your men to go parole them, what actually happened? We would take them out back and shoot them. Yeah. So but this was because of General Henry Halleck, who said that all guerrillas would not be considered Confederate soldiers. I always thought I was a Confederate fighting for the cause. It's March 13th, 1862. Mm. Halleck issues the order uh, in which he, a proclamation, which he outlaws guerrillas, you, and promised that, quote, they will not have captured, be treated as ordinary prisoners of war, but will be hung as robbers and murderers. We would rarely take Union troops as prisoners after he said that, and we would shoot to kill. I wonder how, with the brutality of this, how you could create a band uh, of raiders uh, as large as, as you, in fact, did. What, what was it that attracted them to you, and, and how could you convince them to stay when this was so brutal? Most of them were Jackson County farm boys. <laughs> they were men like Bill Anderson. Bloody Bill Anderson. Mm -hmm. Cole Younger, William Gregg, Fletch Taylor. Most of these boys had lost their daddies to Union troops. 
So I didn't have to convince them of anything. All of the members of my early gang were there for revenge. I didn't want looters and plunderers. I wanted men that wanted payback. So you would think that they were untrained boys, but they grew up near the Sny, the Sny bar. And if you can ride your horses through there, in those deep ravines, those high hills with the rocky slopes, those creeks and caves in there, well, I'll put your horsemanship up with any in the nation. It does seem to me one thing that we're leaving out here is the age of everybody in your, your band that may explain some of this wild bravery and maybe explain some of the actual activities and how extreme they were. When the Civil War started, I was 24 years old. 24 years old, and most of the men who joined you were younger than you were. 18 years old and up, we would take them. Tell us about the story of George Searcy. He was a Confederate deserter. Oh, we can forgive that. He was a horse thief, and we can forgive that. But he tried to kill me in my own country, and we couldn't forgive that. Right. So we found him with 75 head of horses that didn't belong to him. It wasn't hard to find him. We also found deeds and mortgages from various people, union people, Confederate people, everyone in the area. So we strung him up, and he wanted to have a little speech, try to defend himself. And we gave him about three or four minutes before we realized this speech was never going to end. <laughs> so we ended it for him. And but we returned every horse and every piece of paper. It didn't matter if you were with the union or the Confederacy because we didn't want them to think we had anything to do with a son of a bitch like that. But then there's the story, uh, after Halleck's order, you go to a, a bridge over the, the Little Blue. You're chasing a, a Union Army sergeant, and you notice that he's a German. You find out that he's a, a, what's called Dutch in Missouri at that point. Oh, yes, the Dutchman. And of course, the Germans in St. Louis were the leading uh, cause of Union victory in, in, in St. Louis at the beginning of the war. And what happens to that Dutch sergeant? Well, he was the first to feel our no-quarter policy, and we shot him down dead by the you, bridge. You disarmed him, and then there was the bridge keeper on that bridge, and he was accused by one of your men of being a spy, and you had a little trial for him that lasted, what, a couple minutes? <clears throat> Two-minute trials, yes. Two minutes. And then you shot him, is that right? Absolutely. In front, of, in front of his young child who was there with him. Right after Halleck's order, making you a, a guerrilla subject to immediate termination, the Confederate States Congress passes the Partisan Ranger Act, April 21st, 1862, making you, theoretically, a legitimate soldier. It said you went to Richmond to try and, and get a promotion to colonel. Well, if they weren't going to take captain seriously, maybe they would take a colonel seriously. But so again, I, there's no evidence that you actually ever got there. Well. If they don't think a captain means anything, I can call myself a colonel and it won't mean anything either. What happened after, after these orders and the identification of you as a partisan ranger is you rob the mails, you rob jails, you rob banks, in fact, banks, farms, trains, steamboats. Anything to stop the communication of Union troops, anything to put them into disarray. Well, but the rules of war and the proportionate use of force and traditional measures of, of war begin to be violated all over the place. And violated, it should be said, by both sides. But the, the federal government sent out a whole series of men to try and get control of this. But never worked out that way, did it? Not when General Thomas Ewing Jr. came. E Ewing began to do things that uh, were different from any anything anybody else had done. He had, for instance, he started to round up women. Yes, any girls that were relatives or loved ones of the guerrillas and the raiders, he locked them up right here in Kansas City. You were able to survive in the ravines of Snybar in eastern Jackson County, in part because the farms in that part of Missouri were owned by southern sympathizers. In fact, you lived off them, essentially. Absolutely. We were fighting for the people. If we didn't have any help, we couldn't have done what we did. We could go to any farm. We could hide out in any bush. We could have people find food for us, ammunition. We were not alone. And so what General Ewing, of course, was trying to do was to cut off your source of supply. By taking the sisters and the cousins, little girls, if you know anything about Southern chivalry, we would not harm the women. But these Union men wanted to change the rules again, locking them up in a second-story room above a saloon 
and a storehouse next to a body house. And it's at this moment, and we're talking about August of 1863, you begin to think about raiding Lawrence. And why, why Lawrence? Lawrence was the great hotbed of abolitionism in Kansas, the capital of the free state movement, everything the Southern man was fighting against, part of the Underground Railroad. And it had not been touched, not a scratch, since the war began. And on August 10th, uh, 1863, you bring your men together, your senior men, and you have an, an all-night war council. Absolutely. Which you talk about this, and some of your men thought it was very dangerous to go oh. into the heart of the free state, the capital, in essence, of the free state. We movement. had to convince a few of them. And you know, it was 50 miles away. You could ride 25 miles on a horse with no ill effects. Now you ride 50 miles and you're going to have some trouble. There's well, union troops all scattered throughout right, there. You're likely to be seen during that, that period of time. And even if we get there, how are we getting out? So it was a dangerous mission. And, and yet your war council voted unanimously to do it. All I had to do was ask them if, if any atrocities had been done to them or their loved ones over the years by Jayhawkers and Red Legs and union troops. And they could all recite something horrible. That still doesn't explain the ferocity, though perhaps some of the ferocity can be explained by what happened on August 13th. It took mm -hmm. you a week after the War Council uh, to, uh, uh, to prepare for the raid, but in the middle of that week, on August 13th, 14th and Grand, that was housing as prisoners all these women who were related to the men in your band. Uh, and it fell to the ground killing a number of them and maiming the rest. Almost Absolutely. everyone was, was injured, including the, the two sisters, one of whom died of Bloody Bill Anderson. And Some say it was an accident. Others say they saw the store merchant pulling his merchandise out of the building that same day. Some say they saw Union soldiers cutting the girders, maybe going to the body house, maybe on the orders of Ewing. Maybe it was sabotage. And they were the first women, in essence, to die in this part of, of the war. And a man like Bloody Bill Anderson, he didn't need any more motivation to kill. But his revenge could not be satiated after that day. So you took your, your band to, to Lawrence, and it took you two days. There was a group of uh, actual official Confederate soldiers that joined your band. I started with 150 men. Bill Anderson brought 40. Andy Blunt, 100. So we started with initially 300. Then we met Colonel Holt with 100 men, new recruits from northern Missouri. We invited him to Lawrence to christen his troops. So there were 450 troops all together, which was the largest irregular force in the Civil War that had ever been, had been accumulated up to, up, up to that point. You get to Lawrence. And, and the first person you meet is Reverend Snyder, who's a lieutenant in the second uh, colored uh, infantry. He's milking a cow, and what happened to him? He was initiated as the first victim of Lawrence. You, you charge down uh, Massachusetts Street with your, with your men, and here's a description of it from uh, a person on the other side, a Lawrence resident who, who saw it. The horsemanship of the guerrillas was perfect. They rode with that ease and abandon, which were acquired only by a life spent in the saddle amid desperate scenes. Their horses scarcely seemed to touch the ground, and the riders sat upon them with bodies erect and arms perfectly free and revolvers on full cock, shooting at every house and man they passed, yelling like demons uh, at every uh, bound. On each side of this stream of fire were men falling dead and wounded, and women and children half-dressed, running and screaming some trying to escape from danger and some rushing to the side of their murdered friends. So you were there to murder and you did. Absolutely. Now you remember, this is five in the morning. All these people were still asleep when we got to town. And they did have two regiments there, one white, one black. One was on New Hampshire, one was on Vermont. I was going straight down Massachusetts Street. And the white regiment barely got out of their tents before we wiped them all out. Now the colored regiment did what only unarmed men should have done, run for the river. And, and there was a city ordinance that said that no man could carry a firearm in Lawrence. They were all packed away in an armory. That left the entire town defenseless. 
so you're shooting unarmed people as you ride through town. You get to the Eldridge, which of course has been attacked before. Well, the Eldridge looked like a fortress, four stories high, iron wrought bars on the windows. If you could control the Eldridge house, you could control Lawrence. And before I could even get a shot off, a white sheet dangled from an upstairs window. It was the State Provost Marshal of Kansas, Alexander Banks, came down to greet us asked what our business was, and I said justice and plunder. Now he looked at me strangely and he said, those two things rarely go together. I smiled and said, when they do, it's all the sweeter. Now, those that wanted to kill could kill, but we were going to burn Lawrence to the ground that day, make them pay for everything they had done since the beginning of the war and before. That's exactly what you did. You went after Jim Lane, but you didn't capture Jim Lane. Well, regrettably, he saw that colored regiment run past his place, and he followed suit, crawling on his belly through the cornfields. It said that by the end of the day, as many as 200 men and boys, including 11-year-old boys and 12-year-old boys, uh, were shot and killed by your men. That, that's an extraordinary thing. It may have been the, the, the single bloodiest killing of civilians uh, in, uh, in the history of the United States. None of us regretted being at Lawrence that day. We were proud to avenge our fathers and mothers and sisters. You left Lawrence triumphant in your mass killing, retreated to Jackson County. Of course, the soldiers are on your tail, and as many as 90 or 100 of your men are, are lost. In September, a month later, you would have thought things would have, would have ended with this, but they don't. I called for men, and over 500 came because of General Order Number 11. General Ewing depopulating Jackson County and four other counties. Now, you uh, weep for these 200 men and boys that died in Lawrence. But, you know, he was just moving people out. You were killing people. 20,000 people displaced. But you were killing people. They killed them while they left. They burned their homes. It's called the Burnt District. He burned the border down. There's only one town where every building, with one exception, was, was, was burnt, and that's Lawrence, Kansas. But that, you didn't stop. So you, you went back into Kansas with these 500 people you raised with your, your, your new call, which is extraordinary that you're able to get another 500 in this burnt district where everyone is being moved out and three years into the war. And you head, you head south in Kansas. You're actually heading, uh, heading to the Cherokee country uh, and came to Baxter Springs. Right. We saw wagons with lumber going that way. And... They said they were going to Fort Blair. Well, none of us had heard of Fort Blair. So we went to check it out, and it was a half-made fort, basically. And then you came across General Blunt, the, uh, the, who was in charge of the Army in that part of the, uh, the world, and, and, right. and you fought the Battle of Baxter Springs, which is, in fact, the only actual military engagement, true military battle that you were ever in charge of. I had 300 men. He had 100. Simple and, arithmetic. And, and, and of those 100, many of them were members of the military band who he was organizing to play as he walked into Fort Blair. <laughs> so maybe the victory at Baxter Springs, and it's said by some historians that Baxter Springs and Lawrence are the only Confederate victories in the West during 1863, but some victories. Uh, we were doing something right then. The centrality of your band is, is reduced, and in fact, Todd takes it over. Um, and Bloody Bill goes off on his own where, you know, he goes to Centralia where, where he paroles a whole series of people, 21 unarmed, ununiformed troops. He takes off a train in, in, in Centralia and executes. My protégés. Yes. Your protégés, exactly. You head off <laughs> east towards St. Louis, eventually into Kentucky. And, and at this time also the Confederate states, because they don't want any more guerrilla warfare going on, they, want, they need real troops. They repeal the Partisan Ranger Act. You're pretty much disbanded. You've got a small band in Kentucky. I think it's interesting that your horse, uh, is it Old Charlie? Old Charlie. Is There's shot out horse. from under you. Yep. It was a horse only I could ride. And when he went down, it took a little bit of me with him. And in Kentucky, they had a different way of going after people. They didn't send troops in. They sent bounty hunters. 
and one caught up with me at the Wakefield Farm. They shot me in the back, which paralyzed me, but that didn't take the fight out of me. It was when I was on the ground, they took a pot shot at me, and blew off my trigger finger. Your trigger finger was gone. That pretty much ended it, ended it all for you. Well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard the story of William Clark Quantrill uh, and his raid on Lawrence in the not so civil parts of the Civil War. Was what happened an act of terror, a reprisal in a series of mutually elevating, escalating reprisals? Just another battle in a war, a series of acts of war? Or was it an evil and bloody day in Lawrence, Kansas, maybe the bloodiest and most evil day in American history? You are now the judge of William Quantrill. Thank you. He's a Civil War guy, but it's not your regular Civil War story. I mean, this is Missouri, Kansas, this is East and West, this isn't North and South. And particularly in this area, uh, if you're on the Confederate side, he's one of the, the heroes. But if you're on the Union side, he's the devil. So to learn both sides of the story, uh, you know, both the highs and the lows, I think that's the best way to go. Is, and you have to mention Quantrill if you're in this area. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri and by these fine organizations.